Hey, welcome in. Well, we've got another in our ongoing series of uh, Victor Davis Hanson articles because he writes a lot of articles <laughs> and uh, there's a lot more meat in them than you get from, you know, the typical three minute appearance on Fox News or somewhere else where they're more bound to the, uh, the laws of concision than we are right here. And if you were here, you, you probably think that Victor Davis Hanson is a really impressive thinker, as I do, so it's really worth doing this. And this is a really interesting one, coronavirus crisis. It's what we don't know that scares us. And this is very appropriate for me right now because I just had to take a little plane trip for four days. Uh, and of course, I got sick. I didn't really want to go on a plane. Well, I didn't want to go on a plane at all or go anywhere. I just wanted to isolate at home, but I had to do it. So I went, now I'm sick. I feel like I have a cold. Is it coronavirus? I don't know. If I end up in the ICU, I, I promise I will try. I'll try to the best of my abilities to do a video from the ICU, from the uh, coronavirus ward. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I just basically feels like I got a cold. So who knows? But if all of a sudden there's no more videos on my channel for a while, well, you know what happened. Anyway, let's get into this. And this is from uh, Fox News. Uh, the recent spread of the coronavirus is causing a global panic. It's also causing a very local panic right in my house <laughs> right now as well. But anyway, global panic. Our shared terror arises not so much from the death toll of the flu-like disease. More than 3,200 people have died worldwide. But from what we don't know about it. Experts at least agree that the virus originated in China. But Beijing's authoritarian government hid information about its origins, spread, and severity for weeks. And let's just take a quick look here at the John Hopkins uh, map here. And, well, there's China. And it's pretty much all that whole area is now. So that's not good. Although they say the cases are coming down. Who knows? Is it true? Is it not true? 121,000 cases confirmed worldwide. Uh, 10,000 in Italy, 9,000 in Iran, 7,700 in Korea. It's spread all over the place. This yellow line here was the locations of the spread outside, or the cases outside of China. And you can see for a long time there, it was basically flat, and now it's going up fast. Here on February 26th, it was 3,300. And now on the 11th of March, 40,000. So you can see, I mean, it's... That's just going up and up and up. So that's where we are with it. Anyway, back to the article. Hey, if you could uh, subscribe, like, and share, that really helps me out. Thanks a lot. Uh, such duplicity only fanned the fears of a global plague, a hysteria not seen since the groundless fears of a Y2K global computer meltdown in the year 2000, or the political feeding frenzy during the Hurricane Katrina relief effort. Now... I'm not, is it hysteria? Um, I got back from my trip and the uh, toilet paper aisle was completely empty at the local uh, grocery store. I mean, there was food, there was food and everything, it's fine. Just the toilet paper was all gone. Didn't matter to me because I already stocked up on everything well in advance. But yeah, I guess there is some hysteria going on. And global plague, well... You know, how do we define, I mean, like Black Death? It's not that. Um, but, I mean, it is a pandemic. It's been classified as a pandemic. And also, this article was from six days ago. So, it's not completely up to date. Here it says, A conspiracy theory arose that it was a manufactured virus that had escaped from scientists' botched efforts to create either a vaccine or a biological weapon. So, I guess technically a conspiracy theory, but let's just take a little bit... This is a, a map of, this is the Wuhan Center for Disease Control and Prevention, a level four security uh, bio lab in Wuhan. That's the uh, epicenter. That's where it was thought to have originated that uh, live animal market. And there is the bio lab and it's uh, 911 feet away. So is it wild speculation? I don't think so. I don't think so. But again, there's no evidence, but I think I might disagree or, or question some of what Victor is saying in this article more than I usually do. 
So talking about that uh, live animal market, uh, he goes on, unfounded rumors spread that the virus may have originated in one of these markets where exotic mammals such as bats and pangolins are still sold for human consumption. For all China's gleaming high-speed rail lines and new airports, hundreds of millions of Chinese still live in places with suspect food safety and waste disposal, the historic incubators of epidemics. And China is shutting down that exotic animal trade. So I, I would guess these live markets that are selling, you know, bats and pangolins and other things. So they seemed a bit concerned about it. And here's something interesting. The method of the contagion has been perplexing to experts. Why is the mortality rate for infected patients in Iran roughly double that of patients in countries such as South Korea, Italy, and Japan? Why have almost no children under 10 died from the infection? And let's, let's take another little peek here at something else. Here we have from world of meters. Uh, here we have Italy, right? At 12,000 cases, 827 at total deaths. So if that number of cases is correct, that'd be, what about a six, 7% mortality rate in Italy? South Korea, 7,700 uh, cases or 7,755 total cases, 60 deaths. So that's under 1%. Here in Iran, 9,000 cases, 354 total deaths. So place that maybe at around 3%, maybe 2.8 or something like that. So a wide range just in these three countries. So what's going on there? Is there two strains? Uh, are, are, are the number of cases, you know, well below the reality? You know, does South Korea have a, a really good handle on how many cases they have? And then the deaths in some of the Italy and Iran don't they just have far more than they think and that's why they're showing what would seem to be a higher percentage of mortality again just a lot that's not known here are we uh, instead overestimating its dangers thousands of patients may have already recovered from mild cases and perhaps never knew they were sick in the first place because there is a lot of mild cases if you're generally if you're young it seems that it's not it's not too bad for you i mean i could have it right now i don't know all I know is that they won't test me even if I ask them to because I haven't been to Italy or Iran or China or anywhere any, out of the country at all. Evidence suggests that only about 2% of patients will die after infection. As in the case of other viral illnesses, the unfortunate victims are mostly elderly people with existing illnesses. Yeah, so that's why it's kind of ravag ravaging through uh, seniors uh, centers like uh, in Washington State. Does that pattern suggest the coronavirus may be more like annual influenza outbreaks, deadly to thousands, but hardly the stuff to shut down a global economy? And that raises the question. I mean, do governments just say, well, worse than the flu, it's, if it's 2%, that's 20 times worse than the flu in terms of mortalities. But is there some point where governments just say, well, you know, it's everywhere. People are going to get it. Just everybody go to work and it'll work itself out. I don't know. I have no idea. But what we do know is that it's, you know, it's not the Black Death, but it's not just the flu either. Anyway, it continues, the common theme of history's great plagues, Athens in 430 BC, Constantinople in 541, and the Black Plague of 1347, was that pre-industrial conditions of filth and ignorance helped spread what were usually bacterial diseases transmitted by lice, fleas, and rodents. And, you know, it might be interesting to do... Uh, do a video on maybe one of these plagues. Let me know in the comments if, if that'd be something you'd be interested in. Real plagues can certainly change history. A stricken Athens afterwards lacked the power to defeat Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. The Byzantine Emperor Justinian would never finish his half-completed dreams of a new reunited Rome. The Black Plague helped usher in the end of the Middle Ages. History also reminds us that nature remains unforgiving. We may live in the age of the internet, smartphones, and jet travel, but viruses are indifferent to so-called human progress. And, you know, that's, that's such, a, that's such a, a good point, right? Because if you have a virus where you don't have any immunity to it, for the year, year and a half it takes to come up with a vaccine for the virus, what's really the difference between you and somebody in the Middle Ages before they even knew what germs were? I mean, I guess the main difference would be you'd have, you know, clean drinking water. You're going to be way better fed uh, than somebody in the Middle Ages. You know, we have, you know, great hospitals with supportive care, 
But supportive care isn't a cure. All supportive care is doing is helping your body to fight off the infection on its own because it does have to do it on its own. Ultimately, your body does have to learn, figure out a way to to deal with the infection without a vaccine. So, you know, we we are (laughs) we are largely as as vulnerable as somebody was a thousand years ago. Anyway, let's continue. Modern life squeezes millions into cities as never before. Jet travel with its crowded planes and airports can spread diseases from continent to continent in hours. And that's something that didn't happen a thousand years ago. It it, it did spread across continents. I mean, you know, from Asia to Europe, but it took a while. Globalization is a two-edged sword. It may enrich billions of people, but the leveling effects of an instant communication and travel can spread disease at a speed undreamt of in the past. And just on that note here, I just want to point something out. Here's here's Tom Cotton calls China travel ban the single most consequential and valuable thing done to slow down the coronavirus. And that was done on January 31st. And while there seems to have been a lot of you know, things lacking in the U.S. response to it, that's being credited with giving them breathing space, you know, giving them some breathing space to try, you know, for the the faulty test kits, for example, you know, for the for the country to organize the, the medical infrastructure to deal with a major outbreak, which probably is going to happen if it's not many people have still been tested. So we really don't know how many people are infected in Canada or the U.S. It's just we don't know. But, I mean, there's this stuff. There's a very basic thing. Don't let anybody in. I mean, one thing that has to be said is that if once the outbreak had started in Wuhan, if nobody had left China, nobody else would have got it outside China. I mean, that's just a fact. I know the, the, the leftist media and mainstream media is trying to say now just saying Wuhan virus, you know, like where it's from, where the Wuhan virus came from is now racist insane it, just not helpful at all and of course they criticized trump for the usual isms when he he blocked the travel from china on the 31st of january and, but that is just a basic common sense thing you can do at least to buy yourself some time right i don't think many people are complaining about that now they were complaining about it at the time and i also would expect that the wall has gotten a lot more popular over the last couple of months for some people Anyway, let's continue. Borders are now considered passe in the age of globalization, but their enforcement reminds us that not all nations are alike. All sovereign peoples should have the right to take measures for their own safety well beyond the purview of the transnational elites. And here we get back to, like, who was criticizing shutting down the border? Was it normal people? Was it normal people that were saying, no, no, it's racist to shut down travel from China? No, it was It was uh, elites in the media. That's who it was. And politicians. And here's a really great point. Finally, is it wise or safe to allow hundreds of thousands of homeless to live crowded amongst filth, vermin, and squalor on the sidewalks of America's major cities? Something uh, that's been talked about a lot. I think Dr. Drew is a notable guy who's talked about that quite a bit. He's really raised that. And there you're talking about, I believe, bacterial infections uh, carried on fleas on rats. And they have a massive rat population in, in L.A., for instance. That's another ticking time bomb right there. And here he says the coronavirus threat and the unfounded hysteria that has accompanied it will pass. Well, I don't know. Maybe not so quick on that. <laughs> maybe not so quick on that. I mean, an, an unfounded hysteria. Now, you shouldn't be hysterical. I'm not hysterical. Um, I don't think most people are hysterical, but concerned, you know, having your eye on the ball, you know, maybe doing some prep, you know, um, making sure you've got supplies in case you need to self-isolate for a while. Those are all smart things to do, even if, you know, it could be an earthquake or a flood or something two years or five years from now. Who knows? Who knows what? Right. I mean, if you're hysterical over it, yeah, you shouldn't be hysterical. Absolutely. But concerned. Absolutely. And anyway, let's finish this off. But the specter of pandemic offers a timely warning to remember that we are not necessarily any more immune from volatile nature and humankind's paranoid response to it 
than were the ancients. Yeah, because this is something that is an unknown. There are still lots of things we don't know about this. We don't know for sure what the actual, you know, mortality rate from this is going to be. We don't know if it's going to mutate, if it's going to turn into something less dangerous, more dangerous. We don't know really where it came from, exactly. We know the, the region that it came from, but what it, what animal did it come from? Nobody really knows for sure. Can anybody say exactly what the situation is going to look like in a month, in two months, in three months? No. I mean, we can make educate, educated guesses. I don't think this is the end of uh, civilization. But what's going to happen with the, econ with the economy? What's going to happen with the stock markets? I don't know. And nobody really does. That's the thing. So this is an excellent point. I mean, we are kind of, for all of our accomplishments, we're still very vulnerable. And in some ways, just as much so than the ancients were. I get the feeling that I'm perhaps a little more worried about it than Victor Davis Hanson is. And I don't think that's, uh, that's unfounded. But again, I'm not actually hysterical, so I take his point. Anyway, I think this was an interesting article. I hope you enjoyed it. Check out the Victor Davis Hanson playlist on my channel. I have to ask you if you could please subscribe if you want to see more content like this because the algorithms aren't going to show it to you. They don't like this kind of content. If you don't have time to watch my videos, you can listen to them while you're driving or jogging or whatever. Radio Baloney, it's on Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts and iTunes and Spotify and CastBox and Spreaker and all, basically every single platform. It's on Radio Baloney, The Richie Baloney Show. Look it up. You will find it. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.